Imagine this for a second. You're bullish on Tesla, you've heard it's the future and you want to invest. But you also know that you need to diversify in order to reduce your risk. So what do you do? You take a look around, you find a few other good companies like Neo, Workhorse and Nikola and you put your money in them. And you also get some Dogecoin because it's been blowing up recently. And finally to top it off, you decide to get a mutual fund. And which one to get? Katie Woods Arc has been blowing up recently. Last year it's had a phenomenal performance, so you decide to buy it as well. And there you go, you're set, you're diversified, your risk is minimal, right? Wrong. Stick around and find out what some of the top Wall Street pros say about diversification. To start off with, I want to say that not everyone on Wall Street has our best interests at the heart. In fact, it's more likely that they have vested interest in misinforming us so that they get the best deals. Basically, it's usually wise to avoid taking their advice at face value. Still, there are some who do care about giving good advice, at least in my opinion. And not a lot, just a few, but we don't really need more. But also, before I dig in, I want us to bear in mind that these investors are in different circumstances to most of us. They don't have 10 or 20 or $50,000 to invest. They've got billions, hundreds of billions in some cases, and they must diversify. We don't. If we do, we don't need to go to the same extremes as them. Of course, unless we want to. Now, let's take a look at what some of them have to say about diversification. First of all, let's look at Ray Dalio. He started and managed Bridgewater Associates until 2017, and it is the largest hedge fund in the world with assets under management, which are roughly 150 to 160 billion dollars. So, he leans more towards macro investing. He's not your your typical stock picker investor, so his diversification choices tend to be a little bit different. Still, it's the reasoning behind it that's really important. Ray has a famous approach to investing, his so-called all-weather portfolio. It's said that it is able to withstand any problems or crisis in the market. The first thing that we see is the largest allocation goes to long-term bonds. Then, we have 30% in stocks. So, from what I've noticed, Ray Dalio usually tends to lean towards using index funds as a proxy for stocks. They're great for diversification because they have minimal fees and at the same time you get exposure to a huge variety of stocks. For example, you can get an S&P ETF which has roughly 500 stocks or you can get one that tracks emerging markets or even the whole world. The next asset has 15% allocation and it is comprised of bonds with a shorter duration between 3 and 7 years. And then we have an equal split between commodities and gold. Both have roughly 7.5%. Bear in mind that the percentages are rough estimates. They don't have to be like 100% precise. Ray Dalio claims that if you diversify well, you lower your risk without lowering your expected return. And a key to this is picking assets with low correlation. So assets that do not tend to move together in price. It's a simple concept, which he has called the holy grail of investing. Generally, we can see that his approach typically leans towards a more fixed income strategy. So 55% out of it would be bonds mixed with some stocks and then a little bit of commodities. However, diversification should always be based on the context and market conditions. In recent interviews, Dalio has said that it's pretty crazy to own cash or bonds right now and he's referring to the negative real interest rate, which is basically the interest rate of the security minus the inflation. And right now in the US we have yields which are slightly lower than the inflation, meaning that they're not really generating any real money. In some of his latest interviews, Ray has shared that he recommends diversifying based on assets, currencies and countries. If we take a look at his latest portfolio from February, we can see that he has almost no bonds. What he does have though is quite a lot of ETFs, so that his biggest holding is the Spider ETF, which is basically an ETF that tracks S&P 500. The next one is the VWO, which is the Vanguard Emerging Markets ETF. And following that we have Gold. And then you can see that he has bought into quite a lot of different stocks, but mainly ones that I would regard as much more stable or undervalued. So the biggest one is Walmart, followed by Procter Gamble, followed by Alibaba. And essentially we see that he's following his own advice. So he's getting different assets. So for example, he has both stocks and gold. He depends on different currencies in different countries. So he's involved in the US, but he's also involved in emerging markets and overseas markets. One of his largest holdings, as we just saw, is Alibaba. So this is a purely Chinese company. And essentially we get the idea that it's good to get assets with different correlations. So we can expect that if Walmart, for example, goes up or down, it's not going to be correlated to Alibaba simply because they're based in different countries and they serve different markets. 
I'll put three of his latest interviews down in the description below. I recommend watching them. They're very educational, very interesting, and they'll give you a very good idea of what is going on right now in the markets. The next investor that we will cover is Warren Buffett. His diversification advice can be summed up in a single sentence. If you know how to analyze businesses, don't diversify. He has a famous quote, diversification is protection against ignorance. And that essentially means that the chances of you losing money relative to the market, if you are not a good investor, are lower if you have a diversified portfolio. In fact, even only owning an index fund is a perfectly reasonable strategy for the average investor. However, if you, like me, are interested in analyzing businesses and think that you've found some good ones, he suggests buying them, buying a lot of them. He jokes that in his personal portfolio, he only has one stock. <laughs> Can you guess which one it is? But jokes aside, he explains that if you only own three wonderful businesses, you can get a better return than by owning 100 average ones and your investment will be, in fact, safer. What is a wonderful business, as he calls them? Those are businesses which are resistant to effective competition and some value investors would say that they have a strong moat. They have strong products which are not easily replaceable, they are entrenched in a specific market. His favorite example is Coca-Cola, but a more current one could be Amazon. Another reason why he suggests concentrating your holdings is because it is simply impossible for a single individual to find 30 different wonderful companies, understand them well enough and at the same time have enough time to keep track of them. Moving on, we have Michael Burry. Most of you probably know Michael Burry. He's notorious for his bets against the housing markets during the great financial crisis of 2007 to 2009. I'm personally a big fan of him, he has a rational analysis, and I see him as someone who has little interest in misinforming the public, so I think he's generally trustworthy, and I think he's someone we can learn from. He is a bit of an enigma though, and he doesn't really do any interviews, he doesn't really have any books either, he had a Twitter account briefly this year, he has deleted it now, so how can we find out what he thinks about diversification? Well, his fund in the early 2000s was managing money for other people, so he was obliged by law to write shareholder letters every quarter. And a quick Google search can give you a PDF with pretty much all of them. I went digging through these and I managed to get a good idea of his strategy for diversifying and managing risk. Similar to Warren Buffett, he doesn't really own a lot of stocks. He says that he generally sticks to roughly 15 to 20 stocks, but he points out that even a portfolio of 15 stocks can be considered sufficiently diversified. His main focus seems to be on buying companies with, as he puts it, a little correlation between intrinsic value. And a simplified way to explain this is to simply buy stocks in different industries. But some industries are correlated. For example, as we saw with the markets last year, stocks like hotels, airlines, even cinemas and cruises can move in tandem. It's important that we pick companies in industries that rely on different factors to perform well. In his shareholder letters, Burry also dismisses leveraging, options and shorting to an extent as a form of diversification. Although having said that, I took a look at his holdings at his current fund and I actually saw that he owns a fair amount of options for companies. However, it's important to know that he owns options for companies that he doesn't have any shares in. He does say you should diversify sensibly and you shouldn't consider buying overpriced assets to be a diversification. Buying Tesla to diversify is probably not the smartest move right now. And actually, there is a very good recent example of that. Bill Huang. He managed the Archigos fund and his portfolio had, I believe, somewhere between 20, 30, maybe a bit more stocks. But they were all incredibly leveraged and risky and he ended up losing everything in just a few days when the markets went, went against him. And he had 20 billion. It's an extreme example, but it's so fascinating and I recommend you look into it. I'll put a link in the description below. Finally, the whole point of diversification is to reduce risk, but Michael Burry says that buying sufficiently undervalued stocks is low risk anyway, so we should bear that in mind too. The final investor that we will look at is Peter Lynch. He was the manager of the Magellan Fund between 1977 and 1990 and averaged roughly 29.2% annual returns over that time. His approach to diversification is actually very simple. Buy the 10 best companies that you can find and hold them. That's it. Nothing else. Just 10 companies. They are more than enough for a small portfolio. He says that essentially there is no point in diversification as, as he calls it. Well, in his book, he mentioned diversification as an example for what companies do wrong. The same thing can be said for some individuals. And essentially, this is diversification 
for the sake of diversification. Don't buy a company that is so poor or you are not familiar with. Don't buy the latest hot stock. Tesla, where you at? <laughs> Don't buy small companies with huge plans. They are still mostly a dream. Don't buy companies that have one customer that accounts for 25 to 50% of the entire sales. Essentially, buy solid stocks with a good story, good fundamentals and good long-term prospect. Get 10 of them and you're set. No need to buy options, no need to short, no need to buy gold or bonds or whatever. Just 10 stocks, simple as that. And on the bright side, if you only own 10 stocks, then it's going to be much easier for you to keep track of them, learn about the business, learn about the operations and have a good idea of when the business is doing well. If you want to learn more about Peter Lynch's approach to investing, I recommend reading his books Beating the Street and One Up on Wall Street. They're super digestible, extremely educational and it's super easy to read them. In conclusion, diversification is about optimizing returns while minimizing risk. We can do it in a number of ways, but the two main things to consider are 1. The type of assets and 2. How much to buy. The investors that we've talked about lean towards a stock-heavy portfolio and I personally think that this makes the most sense in the current market. Add in some real estate rate ETFs, a little splash of commodities, but the bulk of it you can safely put in stocks. Index ETFs are a good option, but if you want to get your hands dirty, do your research and pick out solid companies, then go for some with a stable base and a bright future. This concludes the video about four of the most legendary investors on Wall Street and their thoughts on diversification. I'm really interested in finding out how this has changed your way of thinking about investing and diversification, so let me know down in the comments below. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.